What's your name? Stanley Laurel. What's your name? Oliver Norville Hardy, sir. <laughs> Hello, hello, and welcome to the Laurel and Hardy blogcast. As usual, I'm Patrick Vasey, the author of the Laurel and Hardy blog, but not as usual, this is a bonus blogcast. So what does that mean? Well, this is not one of our usual episodes. There is no film in focus today. There is no audio blog, which you may be pleased to hear, but we do have a special guest. We do have a topic to discuss, and we do have the at all question. Tell me that again. Huh? Let me hear that again. So the reason for this bonus episode is that I wanted to mainly highlight this topic because it's something that concerns and annoys me in quite equal measure. Um, I have an interest in it personally, but it's also quite topical and timely at the time of this recording. Um, The topic in question is Laurel and Hardy autographs or the collecting thereof. Now I'm quite interested in obtaining a Laurel and Hardy autograph at some point. I've always wanted one. It's been a real dream of mine ever since, uh, well, ever since I can remember, to be honest. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've promised myself one day I will, I will do that. I'll buy myself a Laurel and Hardy autograph. Um, but just lately, you may have noticed on social media, there's been quite a lot of people talking about autographs and the amount of fakes and forgeries that seem to be uh, for sale on social media auction sites, eBay and so on. Um, and this worries me a little bit when I'm thinking about, uh, you know, w- what autograph should I look for? What should I buy? Um, and I also thought, well, you know, there's probably other people out there in, in a similar boat. And, and how can we sort of find help and support for each other whilst we are considering making this purchase? Um, so what I did, I got in touch with one of our blogheads, Mark Hammond. Uh, Mark has been collecting Laurel and Hardy autographs for many, many years. Um, and over that time, he's got quite a good eye at how to recognize the real deal. So I chatted with Mark for quite some time and I learned so much that I thought, you know what, we could all benefit from this. Um, and I've packaged it all up into a nice bonus blogcast. So I think you'll enjoy this. So as I do with all my guests, I asked Mark his Laurel and Hardy backstory, and I also asked him the infamous at all question, so there's quite some familiar ground here. Um, So without further ado, let's get into the interview with Mark, and let's talk about Laurel and Hardy autographs. Come in, Mrs. Adult Twist. A special living for Mr. Hardy. Oh. Sign, Now, one of the dreams that I've held for as long as I can remember is to own one of Stan and Babe's autographs. It would mean so much to me to have their signatures written by their own hands, a real tangible physical link to my heroes. And I promised myself that one day I'll find the right one and I'll treat myself. And now, if you follow Laurel and Hardy pages on social media, you might be aware that recently there have been a concerning number of fake Laurel and Hardy autographs on sale on eBay. As well as being extremely annoying, it's very troubling to think that honest fans like me are uh, getting fleeced by crooks. So I thought it might be an idea to get a few tips and pointers for any of you out there who, like me, might be thinking of spending some of your hard-earned cash. And so I approached a guy whose name may be familiar to many of you, Mark Hammond. Mark is not only another lifelong Laurel and Hardy fan, he's also a member of our Bloghead community. And importantly for our discussion, he's got one of the best collections of Laurel and Hardy and Laurel and Hardy related autographs you could ever wish to see. I first met Mark back in 2018 at the Helpmates convention in Chatham in Kent. Uh, Mark had a stall, in fact it was a room all to himself, where he was displaying his collection and I was just blown away by it. And I still think about it and drool over it to this day. In fact, I wrote a blog about that event, including C. Mark's collection, and you can find that on the Laurel and Hardy blog website under the bonus blogs tab. So I've asked Mark to join us today to talk a little bit about his collection and collecting in general and to give us wannabe collectors some top tips on what to look for. Okay, Mark, so if you could start, if if I could just ask you about your uh, your Laurel and Hardy backstory, Um, if you could tell us your, you know, your earliest memories of uh, discovering the boys um, and uh, yeah, how you you came across them. Yeah, um, my earliest memory would be probably from the very early 1970s, um, when my dad used to, as a treat on a Sunday, used to put the cine projector up, Um, used to be all sorts of cartoons and just really bizarre different things on cine film. And he he happened to have a couple of Lauren Hardy films, but I couldn't tell you what they were or, 
you know, I just have no memory of 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 the particular film because I think they would they were cut into sections, sort of five minute sections, uh, and then retitled. Um, and he used to put them on, and I just remember laughing really, and and but didn't give it much thought. Obviously, I would have been quite young in those days. Um, and then probably five, six, seven years later, they started to show them on BBC. So you you would come home from school um, again. There would only be two or three channels available to us then, and we'd all sit down and watch Lauren Hardy, um, Ch- Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd. But out of all of them, Lauren Hardy made me laugh, and that's why I think they they stuck with me. Um, you know, I appreciate Chaplin and Keaton and Lloyd. I think they're masters of their craft, but yeah, I, I don't find them funny in the same way. Yes, I'd agree with that. It's a different kind of funny, isn't it? It is laugh out loud stuff with the boys. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I I think that's probably why a lot of people of my my era are are, are Lauren Hardy fans. Because at 10, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, they made us laugh. Um, I can appreciate the others, obviously. But um, so really, yeah, that's where I I found them. Um, But it was a long, long time before you found anything else. No, again, there was no videos, there was no internet. Um, I think the, the next real time that I watched a lot of Lauren Hardy was when they released the Virgin videos in 92. Yeah, 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 that's right, early 90s, that's right. Because I remember looking everywhere to try and find Lauren Hardy videos. And, you know, when video first came out, but obviously they were around. So it was what you could see on the television when it came up. Good memories, though. Good memories. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I remember the very first Virgin video. Um, it was the, yeah, the, it was one of the first things I bought of Laurel and Hardy, and it was the very best of Laurel and Hardy. Did you get that one, the, the VHS? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was just out of this world. It was everything that I remembered from yeah from my childhood, coming home from school, yeah. as you say, uh, on <laughs> BBC Two. Um, and I, I remember the, say, the same collection, the musical moments. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, obviously be all the songs from the films and um yeah it was it was amazing to go from virtually nothing to suddenly having this collection um but yeah every week go down to wherever it was w h smith and buy your buy your the one in the i think there was 20 i can't remember 20 21 videos i don't know well oh, but there's more than that but there's more probably than was that. yeah it was yeah brilliant but, uh, yeah that's that's literally how i got started in 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 following Lauren Hardy, really. And have you always been a collector, Mark? Have you always collected Laurel and Hardy stuff? Or No, the, the collection really started... I, I've always liked um, antiques, things like that, you know. Um, but the collection really started... Um, Teresa, who was my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, wanted to buy me something for, for my birthday. And again, we're going back probably mid-80s, mid to late 80s. Um, no internet again, so there was no eBay. Um, no idea where to look. I'd always wanted a maybe an autograph or I don't know something, something old that, that pertained to the boys. And um, unbeknownst to me, Teresa had uh, got a magazine called The Exchange of Mart, which again I'm not sure if it's still going, but it, it was a classified magazine, and, and she'd found in this magazine uh, an autograph shop in London in a road. Cecil Court. Um, so she rang them to ask if they'd got any autographs, and he told her that he'd had two, two signed postcards, different images. So apparently she asked him if he'd put one by, and he refused. So she <laughs> took the day, yeah. So she took the day off work the next day, went and bought it. And again, I knew nothing about this. While she was there, he told her about the Sons of the Desert, put her in touch with a chap called Bill Cubin. Yeah, who's who's quite obviously quite well known to British sons. Yeah, um, who in turn put her in touch with Rob Lewis, who ran the Helpmates tent at the time. So on my birthday, I wake up, get given this box, open up, autograph, absolutely, obviously over the moon with that, oh, and then all this, all this information, which just my Lauren Hardy world exploded. You know, <laughs> things that I didn't even know existed. Um, you know, fan clubs and meetings and things like that. So that's that's literally how it started. Um, and she told me that 
he had an, uh, the, the autograph shop had, a, had another autograph. So we went up on the following weekend and bought that as well. Brilliant. So I ended up with two autographs in the space of a week. And that, like I say, that was probably mid to late 80s. And then the collecting went from there, really. Um, we got to find out that there were such things as movie fairs. You know, and we used to, this was pre children. So we used to have a bit of spare time and we used to go to all sorts of different fairs, one in Westminster, there was a big one in Birmingham, um, and just trawl these places all day long trying to find Laurel and Hardy stuff, really. Yeah, yeah. And were you looking for just Laurel and Hardy then, or were you looking for, like, co-stars at that point? Or Not, not co-stars so much. I mean, we, we'd actually, the, the second time, or the, the, the first time I went up to the autograph shop in London, we, or Teresa bought a Gene Kelly autograph. So we actually, we actually got into collecting film star autographs. Right. Okay. So, but my primarily my interest was Lauren Hardy. But we we collected a bit of um, you know other film stars etc. But no, at the time it was it was pretty much um, sort of anything Lauren Hardy really old press books programs that sort of stuff. I didn't have a stream my collection then, but it used to be quite funny because after a while you get to know that there's other Lauren Hardy collectors there. And you'd get to a table. I've got anything Lauren Hardy? No, no, sorry. Someone was here five minutes ago and bought the autograph. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, it's probably a, a, a group of probably five or six, seven collectors. Um, got to know most of them over, over time. But, um, yeah, so it was quite comical, really. You'd turn up and you'd all be eyeing each other over the, <laughs> over the board. So there and, but there was one one collector in particular, and you might have come across his name, a chap called Roy Sims. Have you ever heard of Roy Sims? No, I don't think so. Well, he, he was affectionately known as the Hoover. Right. So he used to Hoover everything up, and his collection was incredible. And I got to know him, and Teresa got to know him quite well, and bought a few bits from him, um, but went to his house, and, yeah, his collection was just incredible. Um and you see it come up occasionally, and if there's collectors of Lauren Hardy in the world, they, they probably own something that Roy's owned at some point because he would stick a stamp on it. Don't ask me that, but he'd stick a red stamp on it from the Roy Sins collection. Oh, good grief. Right. But invariably, if it's a if, if it's a theatre programme, it, it came through. You know, so, yeah, I don't know why he did it, but he did. But he, he was he was a prolific collector and had a, and an amazing collection. And he, he actually helped um, A.J. Marriott write the British Tours book in the early 90s. I think a lot of the stuff there, yeah, uh, A.J. gives him quite quite a big credit in the book because I think a lot of, you know, a lot of the stuff in there or the information might have come from items that Roy owned at the time. Yeah, I never thought of that. So that's quite a good way of getting information from the tours, isn't it, from programmes of uh, somebody's oh, collection, yeah. of course, yeah. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So really, yeah, it went, it went from there and... Um, over time, it's just it's just been streamlined, really. You know, I don't. I've got admiration for every Lauren Hardy collector, but but I'm I'm into I like vintage stuff. Yes, you know, so I've sort of I collect uh, all, obviously the boys' autographs, um, the co-stars' autographs, um, stacks photographs, and and the theatre uh, programs and memorabilia, really. So. It sounds like a broad spectrum, but it's it's not really. No, so like, yeah, that's I understand that. It's, so, how many how many Laurel and Hardy autographs do you think you've got? Just of the boys, um, fifty odd, I suppose, over fifty. Fabulous. That's fantastic. not altogether. I've got more. I've got more. Obviously, Stan was a prolific letter writer. Right. Gotcha. And he's like a lot more. Obviously, he lived longer than Babe, so yeah, you know, and, and wrote a lot of letters and always almost always included a signed picture. Um, it might have a, a Babes or an Oliver Hardy stamp. It stamped autograph on that, but Stan tend to sign it as well. So um, there's a lot more of Stan's autographs around than there are Babes. But, um, but yeah, more, more of Stan than Babe um, and probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them together on various publicity material, etc. Wow. Fantastic. Now, when, when I, f I first met you, Mark, uh, it's 2018 at the Hellmates Convention in Kent, and yeah. you had a stand in there, uh, or a store, well, it was a room, actually, full of all of your, well, what looked like all of your collection, and it was just absolutely amazing. I, I wrote a blog about it, I remember, because it's, it's, it, to this day I still think about it and drool over it. 
Um, and um, just explain, to, you know, just what your collection kind of entails because it just blew me away completely. Well, again, that's probably a lot of that's down to Teresa. So she, you know, I like to look at my collection. So a lot, it's all in these folders, obviously acid-free folders. And what, what we tended to do was obviously mount mount the autograph. If it's a signed photo, it would be mounted on its own. And then obviously, in in the case of the co-stars, we we would on the page sitting next to it, we would put the films that they appeared with the boys in. Um, that's probably because my memory's so bad. So every time I look at the oh yeah, they were in that film. Of course they were. Um, yeah. But no, it's yeah, a nice touch to that. This is a good touch. I like I like to see that because it, it just relates them right to those exact films. It's perfect. Yeah, so just basic information when they were born, the co-star, when they died, what films they appeared in. Um, and again, if it's a if it's an album page sign, we would put it with a if I could if I could find an original photograph, I'd put it with that. But more times out of ten it would go in a in a reproduction photograph. Um, again with the information. Um, and I've got obviously my theatre programs are all in binders as well. So what I tend to do with those, I'll either photocopy the inside of the program and mount that in the book opposite the, the original cover or vice versa, depending on the size of the program. Um, so you can see obviously the front cover and also the, in, the internal bit where it tells you what, what running order is, where the boys are, performing generally towards the end of the program they would come on stage so um and i'll probably i don't know, programs i've probably got about 70 or 80 i suppose that so, um quite a few more to get because obviously there's there's lots so you are you are you trying to be a bit of a completist then you're trying to get a program from each show they did not really well i'd love to but i don't yeah. think that would happen but it doesn't get in there because then you've got the press say they were appearing in brighton for example you'd have the program from the week before saying that the boys are appearing you know and so really there's probably for every performance there's probably two or three different programs there'll be one maybe two or three weeks before saying coming next month Stanley or Oliver Hardy, then the week before it'd be appearing next week. So you, you could go on and on, really. Yeah, that's um, true. But I guess that's quite nice because that means it's still you, your collection is still live, isn't it? it? It's never kind of dead, if you like, you know what I mean, for want of a better oh, word. No. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's it's always could, some more. Yeah. And again, it, it, other collectors will tell you, you, you're always looking for maybe the best. So you, you might have a program from, you know, and it could be tatty, and another one turns up, and you okay, I might go for that one because that's a better example of the. So yeah, it's always it's it's organic, really. It just grows all the time. So sorry, but I was just going to ask you about the the, the type of um, the, you know the actors that you've got in the collection as well. So as as well as the boys, you know, who have you got in the uh, in the folders? Um, off well, off the top, men. Uh, James Finlayson um, got a nice postcard that come direct from from his family. Uh, Maybush, Tiny Sanford, um, Walter Long, Arthur Hausman, Thelma Todd, pretty much all of them, really. Um, apart from who, one I've never, ever seen, um, Charlie Hall would be one I would like to get. Yes, that was the one that you mentioned at the in 2018. That and I think I asked you. I said, "Have you got Charlie Hall?" Because <laughs> I was looking for it, and you said you'd never seen one. So what we'll say then on the on the podcast is, if anybody out there has a Charlie Hall autograph that they oh, want yeah. to part with, get in touch yeah. with me, and I'll put them in touch with Mark. How's about that? Let's see if we can sort no, you that, out. With- that would be very good. I mean, I've seen I've seen examples of his writing. I mean, obviously, there's there's two or three really nice, really good books. Yeah, on Charlie. Um, but I've never, I've never seen an autograph signed to a fan, right? Charlie, or I've seen um, photos that he sent home to his family, letters he's written home to his family, um, and I, I think they're obviously in, in the hands of collectors now. Um, so, but yeah, I've never, I've never seen an autograph to a fan from Charlie Hall. Don't ask me why. Maybe, maybe they just weren't recognised in those days, or, or treated as. As stars, I think it's quite a modern thing of, a, you know, the Lauren Hardy fan now. You know, apart from people like Thelma Todd, who, who was quite besides the boys had their own careers, Charlie pretty much didn't. He, he, he supported the boys, really. Um, so maybe they weren't seen as stars, I don't know. Or, or were getting all, you know, people asking for their autographs in, in that era, I don't know, really. 
Yeah, I know he did. He did. He did work with a few others, didn't he? And I think he was with um, Abbott and Costello. I think later on. But as you say, yeah. his yeah, his his bulk of his work was with with the boys, wasn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. Interesting that. We'll see what we I can do for you. I mean, I mean, going slightly away from from all the, uh, I'm I'm quite a big fan of Elvis, and, and you find that now a lot of these uh, people that starred in Elvis movies, you know, were very very. Um, bit part players yeah yeah but since Elvis died they all they get to ask all these conventions and they sign all the and invariably a bit of them with Elvis and they would sign it but I wouldn't think pre Elvis dying there wouldn't have been any of their autographs around no that's a good point no one would know who they were really um so you're, saying, you're looking for sort of personal letters and things, aren't you? Back home to family, I guess that's the yeah, uh, yeah. where you're going to yeah. find it. That's right. But it's amazing what turns up. You know, um, stuff turns up all the time. There was a big auction, I think, a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, I think it was one of Stan's original partners in the vaudeville days. I don't know if you saw that uh, letter. That rings a bell, actually. Yeah, yeah. But they all signed Stan Jefferson. Right. Yes. So, yeah. Um, you know, and that's been obviously hidden away for hundred years, eighty years. You know? So the stuff, the stuff does come to light occasionally. Yeah, I think I remember seeing uh, one of yours. I think it was uh, propped up on the desk uh, at the convention, and that was signed Stan Jefferson. I'm pretty sure that you had one there, and that was just uh, that is just you know real history, isn't it? You know, going pre Laurel and Hart, it's just such a nice thing to have. Such a lucky bloke. <laughs> um, if I sound if I sound jealous at any time, <laughs> you'll know why. You'll know why. Um, yeah, I, yeah. It's not you know going back to to displaying it. It's it's never done to make people jealous. No, I, no, no. You know, I, I I like people to see it. Really, you know, and I think it could be seen. Yeah. Um, you know, although it's my collection now, it's not always going to be my collection. I'm not always going to be here. So eventually it's going to go somewhere else um with hopefully 30 40 years time who knows but you know, i just like people to see it well it's a, gr- a great opportunity to be in the conventions to share it with the fans i mean that is just such a great opportunity i certainly appreciated you being there mark and it was uh yeah i know you know i heard other uh, fans as well saying exactly the same it's just such a brilliant collection to see i mean i, I have it's it's the one of the one of the things i have I have promised myself one of these days i will get some autographs it's the one thing that i would really love to have as a set of the boys autographs um and i what concerns me and the reason i got in touch with you about making this podcast is that i you know there are a lot of fakes out there um Ooh. and certainly just lately there seems to have been a number flagged up uh, online on ebay um so it just rings a few alarm bells so i thought if we could just have a little chat really um for my benefit and also for anyone else out there who's thinking of starting a collection and, and investing in some of the boys autographs um you know could we could you give us a few hints and tips really on where to you know where do we start where do we look for autographs what the kind of the average price is so we know we're not being fleeced um you know how to identify if it's a real or, or a fake things like that um and uh, just yeah, can we just sort of benefit from your experience, Mark? That would be great. Yeah. I I mean, I think first and foremost, it comes from experience of seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of of the boys' autographs. Um, you know, there are there are certain characteristics. Um, I mean, there's obviously there's a very good website um, that actually highlights all the characteristics about fake autographs. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to give give that out. Yeah, of course. Um, it's laurenhardy.org, um, and it's a chap called Dave Tomlinson. Yes, yeah, who, um, yeah. Who is well well known to to lots of people in in the UK, um, and he highlights um, a few of the things to look for. Um, but it's a minefield, you know. Things, for example, like I mean, Stan's Stan's autograph was very consistent all the way through his career. So um, invariably, he wrote in fountain pen. I, I don't think I've ever seen an autograph that hasn't been written in fountain pen. So there's one thing to look out for. Okay. Um, Babe tended to write in ballpoint pen after 1947. Um, he bought the first ballpoint pen at the Ideal Home Exhibition in London. So he tended to write in ballpoint pen. So before um, before that, was he in fountain pen? If it was, if you get like an autograph from the 30s. Yeah, it would have been, yes, it would have been. Um, but again, 
you know, they tended to sign publicity stills and, and not film stills. Right. So that's another thing to look out for. But I've never, I would never say they never signed a film still. It's just quite unusual. So this is where it gets a bit grey, the areas, because, you know, and again, they tended to sign under under their own images. So Stan would sign under his image, Babe would sign under his. But then I have seen, I have seen autographs where they've signed it on the side of the picture. Yes. So, you know, rather than underneath. So it's, I would say the biggest the biggest thing to do is to do your homework. Yeah. You know, don't just accept someone's story, especially on an auction site like eBay. Don't say, I'll oh, accept, oh, well, my next door neighbor's auntie met them in Skegness in 1957, et cetera, et cetera. Just do your homework. Have a look at what, if it comes in an autograph book, ask who else is in the autograph book, then you can then do some research to find out if those people were at that theatre around that time or if they've ever appeared at that theatre. Um, but I would say, yeah, the biggest the biggest tip is to do your homework, really, and check dates out, get a, get a good provenance with it. Um, and failing that, contact someone who maybe knows what they're looking at. You know... I mean, there was, again, there was one on, I think it was about a year and a half, two years ago on eBay. It was a Cunard menu um, that was signed rather badly by boys. Um, and it was dated 1955. 1955? Now, obviously, the boys weren't saying into the UK in 1955. Right, okay. Yeah, that could be proved. Yeah, and, and that's not a hard thing to check out. But unfortunately, the item sold for £700. Ah, eek. So obviously someone is sitting there with that as their pride and joy, and it's not worth the paper it's written on, oh, really. Yeah. And just a little bit of homework yeah. could have told whoever purchased that 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 wasn't right. He's forging my name. Yeah, I mean, one another thing that Stan used to do, he, he would always he would always do a full stop after he'd signed his name. I mean, every I've got, there's a full stop. And, and again, a, a lot of the forgeries don't have that full stop. You know, even if you were fooled by the signature, which, mo- yeah, it, if you know what you're looking for, you wouldn't be. But that full stop is very rarely there if, if it's been forged. You don't have to do it, so... And it's always in the same place, roughly, is it? Pretty much, yeah, in the middle of the L. So when he writes his L, it would be in the middle, if that makes sense, you know, to them. Gotcha. And is, is it right? I've just, I heard somewhere or read somewhere that sometimes, or a lot of the time, Oliver Hardy's signature is upside down or on the side or something. There was some kind of strange thing, and I've seen so many where it isn't, and it just confuses me. No, it doesn't Does that mean it them where, where if, if you'd imagine you're looking at a postcard picture of them, Stan would have written his name as normal across the top of his head. Babes yeah. tends to go Oliver from the bottom to the top, if that makes sense. Oh, okay, right. I would yeah. assume yeah, it's the, the way he's holding the card. It's been handed to him, and, it's not been, and he's not bothered to turn it around the right way, and he's just written it. So, yeah, that, that yeah, that's just a uh, a quirk, I suppose, but I've been sev- I've seen several like that. But it is, you know, for me to sit here and say there's there's a definitive way of telling. There probably isn't, to be honest, without without going into the lengths of the letters and the squirrels and you know one letter running into another letter. I think it does take a long time to, you know, I'd like to think I could just literally look at an autograph and say yes or no. You know. Um, but I think the, big, the the biggest bit of advice I could give is do your homework, and if and if you're not happy with it or there isn't there isn't any sort of providence, just don't buy it. Yeah, yeah, the approach with caution. Yeah. I think it's probably yeah. That's a buy, good, buy uh, beware. I think they say, don't they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, um, I mean, we mentioned eBay, and obviously you can pick up some some good ones from me. But I mean, you were telling me about you've just bought one for twenty quid yeah. <laughs> off of eBay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> One of, my, one of my best of finds, but yeah, yes, that's uh, unbelievable. Um, so, are there any sort of reputable companies or websites that you you would sort of recommend or say that this is a good place to start? For I, I think I think any reputable auction house really. You know, the only you will pay probably 
you know, top of the price range if you go through an auction house. Even if you get one a bit cheaper than the market value, you're going to pay their, you know, their percentage on top of it. But at least you've got some sort of comeback. If you bought, if you went to maybe Christie's, Sotheby's, Bonhams, you know, they have regular autograph sales. Um, and there's quite a few provincial um, auction houses, you know, local auction houses um, that sell them. As far as websites are concerned, I mean, I, I used to, um, I've bought several pieces from a, a company in America called Golden Age Autographs, but he's unfortunately just retired. Um, but I think a partner of his um, classic entertainment autographs, um, they're quite reputable and they are quite often have Lauren Hardy autographs. Um, and there's one in, again, in England that I've used, Regis autographs. Um, but again, if you're buying from a dealer, you're going to pay top of the price bracket, really. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's a peace of mind, I guess, if you, you know, because I guess their experts have looked at them already for you, haven't they? Yeah, so. yeah. And, and I think then <clears> if you go back to eBay, you know, they say, oh, got a, a certificate of authenticity. They're not worth the paper they're written on, really. I mean, there was one recent, again, one recently on there, and it was quite obviously a fake, and it came with a um, a UACC certificate of authenticity, right? You know, Universal Autograph Collectors Club certificate, and you just think, no. And someone, you know, someone who who maybe was buying one autograph and saw that certificate might go for that on on the strength of that, that having that certificate. It is a mind. It is an absolute minefield. As is any sort of collecting these days, really. Yeah. Now you t- you touched on price a minute ago, Mark. What sort what sort of average prices are we looking at for the, for the boys' autographs? Um, I would say uh, an album page or a post. Well, album page. I would say you're probably looking at two fifty to three hundred pounds. It's a nice, clean album page. A postcard, anywhere between three hundred and four fifty, I suppose. And then they did, obviously. They, some of the publicity handouts are seven by fives. They tend to sell 550 upwards, really. And then you're sort of getting into stacks, 10 by eight photographs of double Derby pose, um, a thousand pounds possibly for a good example and probably more. Um, so yeah, they're not cheap, which is surprising because there's quite a lot around. They signed a lot of stuff. Yeah, I guess that's where you know we are quite lucky in certainly in the UK because obviously they toured extensively in the UK over a number of years, didn't yeah. they? So I guess we've got there are good chances of of, of coming across them over here. Yeah, um, yeah no, that's it's that's good to know. It's it's good to get a guide of of the price because you know to start out with, I hadn't got a clue. I hadn't got a clue what what I was looking at and if it was uh, you know worth worth the money or not. So I think anything connected, uh, Patrick. The, in collecting, it's only worth what someone's prepared to pay for it. You know, so if you saw a particularly nice image you wanted and you had X amount of money, you know, it's only, yeah, it could go for all the money, really. Yeah, yeah. How would you go about, just as a matter of interest, you know, Stan and Ollie's autographs, I guess most people are probably quite familiar with what they look like visually. When you come across somebody like, say, Thelma Todd or Edgar Kennedy or, you know, um, Finlayson or whoever what's your point of reference for that or, or certainly what was that when you first started out well I think I think the major the major players um, Maybush like you just mentioned Thelma Todd they signed quite a lot of autographs although Maybush is quite rare there is quite a lot of examples that you can find on the internet of, of her autograph Thelma Todd um, that's a difficult thing really Finlayson um Someone sent me an image of a Finlayson um, a while ago and said they bought it on eBay again. Um, and it looked okay. It looked okay, but it was with in the, in the day people used to get an autograph and they maybe cut a magazine picture out and stick it on the you know on the album page. And at the bottom, underneath the autograph it said 1934, but it was with a picture from way out west, which was 37. Now that would have rung alarm bells with me. Why someone would so all of a sudden, three years later, cut a picture out and stick it? It's almost like it's been contrived. Um, but again, with the co-stars, especially the well-known ones, because the lesser-known ones, there aren't that many autographs around because people didn't know who they were. But 
the more the more major the the coast are there are examples just to compare really and again your homework find out where it was signed any provenance with it um, like i say the finson came when i first bought that and i was told it came direct from the family i was a bit skeptical at first but then the information i got all tied in with what i knew and um yeah just did a bit of homework really yeah yeah that's good. That's good advice. Brilliant. Mark, thanks for that. That's that's superb. Now, I'm I'm not going to let you go before I ask you one final question, which is a <laughs> it's our infamous at all question. Okay. Um just going back to autographs, if we if anybody out there is is considering one, would you be open to to sort of scanning over and having a look at, you know, a photograph of one to see what you think if anybody's Yeah, yeah. I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to. Brilliant. Well, that's great. So if anybody wants to send, you know, you could email me at uh, laurelandhardyblog at gmail.com. Uh, send me your images if you're thinking about it or links to eBay, I guess. Um, and I can always, yeah, I could ask Mark. I promise I won't dip in first and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that by all means, that, that would be great because it does infuriate me when I hear of people buying fakes. It really does uh, annoy the hell out of me. So. The only thing I would um, say, so Patrick, you- sorry to interrupt. The only thing I would say... I know eBay is, you know, there's, there are a lot of fakes on there, but there's also a hell of a lot of genuine stuff on there as well. You know, it's not, I've, I've, I think I read somewhere that someone wrote 90% of the autographs on eBay are fake. Well, that might be the case, but I wouldn't say 90% of the Lauren Hardy autographs on there are fake. I would probably say somewhere in the region of 15%, 10 to 15%. What, what tends to happen on eBay is they're overpriced. You know, um, a lot of them have got starting or buy it now that they're, they're overpriced, but there's quite a lot of good stuff on there. You know, so it's not all doom and gloom. That's good. That's a nice point to end on. We'll 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 run with that, Mark. That's that's really good to hear because uh, you do you do wonder, but that's that's fantastic. Okay. Just to make this binding, you two boys sign there. So, yeah, I'm going to ask you the Atoll question, Mark. I ask this of every guest that comes on to the podcast. Um, so the Atoll question is, you are about to be marooned on a deserted Atoll and you are allowed to take with you four Laurel and Hardy-related items with you. One is a silent short, one is a talkie short, one is a feature film, and the final one is a book, Laurel and Hardy book. What are you going to take with you? Okay, what well, my my silent show would be? Uh, I don't think there's any surprise. It would be big business. Yes, it's a popular choice. Yeah, um, but a brilliant film. Yeah, it is, and, and you, you know you can't fault it because you you know it's got all the hallmark hallmarks of a, a just a classic Laurel Hardy film. Uh, yeah. So yes, I think that would be that would be my my choice for the silent show. Um, for my talky show. Um, there's just so many, and it's a really good question. <laughs> I mean, off the top of my head, I mean, I happened to watch Toad in a Hole last night, and I knew I was going to do this interview. I was thinking, no, that's my favourite. And then yeah, yeah. It. <laughs> but we could go on and on. Perfect day. I love Perfect Day. I love One Turn. I love any old port. But I think if I was to choose one, it would be Blotto. Blotto, brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Solely for that scene where the boys have a fit of the giggles when they perceive themselves to be drunk and was sitting there with the gun wrapped in the brown paper. Stan and says, we drunk your liquor. <laughs> yeah. It's cold tea. And they just go from being roaring drunk to stone cold sober in a split second. In a split second. Yeah. And it's fabulous. A, it's absolute genius. Yeah. Yeah. As I think I've said before, it's just something that they do so well. Just laughing, you know, putting it putting it on, basically pretend, pretending to laugh. They do it so so convincingly. Yeah. Um, you know, we've seen it in in other films as well. Fra Diavolo when they're doing the when they're drunk and all the rest of it. But uh, oh, in um, them there are hills in the trailer with yeah. Charlie Hall. Yeah. Just just fabulous at doing that and it's so infectious you just can't help no. i don't care what kind of a mood you're in when you see those two laughing like that and certainly in blotto it's just brilliant it's great stan, choice especially stan's laugh you know yeah it just <laughs> it's it's so genuine yeah 
you see other films where people are laughing like and it, you think that's, yeah you're putting that on but that that generally looked like they were in film oh yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think i did read somewhere that they just they did keep breaking up though and they they couldn't sort of you know they they had to stop filming in the end because they couldn't do what they were supposed to do because they just kept on laughing well again if you look at some of the some of the um people sitting behind them you know that, yeah. they're laughing they love it as well. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah so, <laughs> but you would, wouldn't you? You yeah, would. You'd be absolutely rolling with yeah. them. Yeah. And I love Fabulous it. Oh, it's a great film. Great film. Yeah. And that stony face of Anita Goff in, in, in the contrast. Yeah. yeah. Fabulous. Great choice. And your feature film? It would have to be Way Out West. I don't think, you know, probably everyone's picked that. And, and it is the complete film, I think. It's got everything the songs, the dancing, the gags, the storyline, the cast. I just think the whole thing is just a classic, really. Yeah, it's very well done and it very tight. As you say, there's not a wasted moment, is there? It just moves so nicely. No. I mean, some of the some of the other features have got some really funny moments, but this is just all the way through. There is something that yeah, just makes you laugh or smile or sing along or yeah, just per- the perfect film. Perfect. The perfect film. Yeah, I was just going to say exactly the same thing. Brilliant. Uh, and your Laurel and Hardy book. Um, that was a difficult one. Um, I can only take one, can't take three. I'm afraid only one. Yes, there is a very strict rule on this. Okay. <laughs> I've got a big suitcase. Um, <laughs> I I would have to, well, I, I love Randy's new revised edition of, yeah. obviously everyone, it's a fantastic book. Um, I also very much like Glenn Mitchell's Lauren Hardy Encyclopedia. And that again was was invaluable for for collecting, you know, um, looking up, you know, you were talking about when I put the co-stars films and when they died, when they're born. It's just a right. Boring, but but if I had to pick one, it would be AJ Marriott's The British Tours. Brilliant, yeah, great book. Again, you know, a lot of work gone into it, a um, lot of facts, a lot of figures, and again. Going back to the collecting side, it, it's been a really handy thing to have to check dates, times, when the boys were where, what city they were in. Um, yeah, so it would have to be AJ Marriott's The British Tour. Yeah, that's a really good choice, actually, as you say. And, and I, it's it's a really nice read as well. It it reads really well, very accessible. Yeah. Um, and what I what I remember, I remember. Um, Every time after after I'd read it, every time I went anywhere in the in the UK, I'd look up where I was going to see where the boys would have been. Yeah. So it was almost like a, a sort of a semi travel guide, if you like. So I could actually go and feel a bit more connected to the boys whilst I was in a new city. Or yeah. Oh yeah, no, brilliant. Definitely. You know, and the fact that it, that it, it tells you if the theatre that they performed in is still there. Uh, yeah. You know. It, yeah. Very. It's been. Yeah. It's been a great book, and obviously yeah. the revised version as well recently. So. Um, Yes, yeah, yeah, in two volumes, I think it is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, I'm going to allow you, yeah, I'm going to allow you one extra choice, Mark. Okay. I'm going to allow you, as you have a collection of your own away from what I've described, um, this is the Your House is on Fire, What Do You Grab? Okay. Not family, not people, I'll get you out of that hot seat. Okay. Um, you're allowed one piece of your collection. What's your key piece in your collection that you're going to take with you? Um my one piece, it would probably be my Brighton pieces. Which, okay. Um, again. I'll, I'll allow that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I have, I'm lucky enough to have a, a box office card from the Hippodrome when they performed in 54. Um, Great. Got a Stan Laurel handwritten letter from the Royal Crescent Hotel when they stayed there oh, lovely. in 50. Yeah, fabulous. And a signed program from 1952 as well. Uh, Lovely, and there's sort of a, a, a not a funny story, but my auntie, bless her, who she passed away six years ago, um, she was forever telling me she saw the boys at the Hippodrome in Brighton with a little glint in my eye, and I just thought it was fantastic that I knew someone who had actually seen the boys. Um, she couldn't remember anything about what they did. She just always said to me she remembered the laughter, you know, people was laughing, um, and. Um, like I say, I'd always look for something from Brighton, never ever come across it. And she she passed away six years ago, and within six months of her passing, I'd found these three items wow. in different places. <laughs> so I, I, I saw them have it as my, that's a little sign to say I told you. Yes. 
So, um, yeah, and, and obviously the program is from from one of the, well, not the same night, but, you know, in the same performance that she would have seen. So it's quite good, really. So yeah, my brother and That's really nice. We've got a family connection to it as well. That's lovely. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you keep those three. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's great. Mark, that's been fantastic. Thank you so much for for passing on your expertise, and um, I feel much more confident now looking, uh, you know, looking out there, and especially knowing that uh, I can always pass it through you as well. Just, yeah. <laughs> just a little bit of a backup. Fine. Fine. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, and um, yeah, keep safe, and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Yes, and you. Thank you, Patrick. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> And so there we go. I hope you found that little chat with Mark useful and interesting, especially if you're thinking of buying a Laurel and Hardy autograph yourself. I know I certainly did. Um, normal broadcast service will resume very shortly with episode 8, where I'll be discussing the boys' first release as part of Hal Roach's new distribution arrangement with MGM, and that is the 1927 silent short Sugar Daddies. Joining us for episode 8 will be our first returning guest on the blogcast, author and silent film historian Steve Massa. You may recall Steve joined us back in episode two when we discussed 45 Minutes from Hollywood and Duck Soup. Um, so if you haven't caught that one yet, you can always go back and check that out anytime you like. Don't forget, if you're not already and you'd like to become a member of our Blogheads community, you can find us at our Facebook group. Just search for Blogheads. I'd also like to encourage you to head on over to the Laurel and Hardy blog website, where you can find all the blogs that I've written so far on the boys' films. Uh, and there's also links to our Laurel and Hardy blog Amazon store, where anything you buy won't cost you a single penny extra, but Amazon will give me a little kickback, which helps to support this podcast and the Laurel and Hardy blog generally. If you're enjoying these podcasts, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or Podbay or wherever you can. Thanks to all those who've left reviews so far. Special thanks to my friend Greg Taylor, who has left a positive review very recently. Thanks, Greg. And thanks once again to the wonderful Mark Hammond for joining us on today's bonus blogcast. And lastly, of course, thanks to you for being here with me again. It's always great to connect with you all. Keep your comments coming in, please. Stay safe, keep laughing, and it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs>